Good evening. I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School of Government, and we're here for a very interesting panel on Yugoslavia, the prospects for change. And we have a particularly distinguished uh, group of panelists to help us with this. This program is being organized by the Kokolis program, which was established here at the Kennedy School in 1997, directed by Dmitry Kiridis, who is here in the front row. And with the aim of building bridges, oops, excuse me, to attend to uh, problems of southeastern and east central Europe. Uh, it supports issues relating to the transition of democracy in what is now the Balkans. Uh, and we have a number of sub programs, including scholarships for graduate study at the Kennedy School, executive training programs for senior level policymakers, conferences, lectures and cultural events. Tonight's event is particularly important in this series because it does deal with the heart of the problem, which are the problems which have arisen over time in Serbia and the problems of democracy. Uh, it was only a year ago that we were all transfixed by the problems of uh, bombing and war, uh, but the problem has obviously not gone away. When one reads the newspapers, one reads accounts of questions of what will happen to the future of Montenegro. Will uh, Montenegro be able to decide its own fate? Will it be decided by, uh, by people in Belgrade, by uh, Mr. Milosevic? Uh, these are issues which uh, uh, are, I think, central to all of our concerns. In the uh, group that we have tonight, we're particularly uh, pleased, therefore, to have his Excellency Dragisha Burzan, who is the Deputy Prime Minister of Montenegro with us. Uh, he was born in Podgorica, Montenegro in 1950, was educated in quantum generators at the University of Belgrade, and has a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. Uh, he actively entered politics in 1989 as one of the founders of the Democratic Alternative, a society of university faculty dedicated to introducing democracy into the parliaments of the Republic of Montenegro and Yugoslavia. In 1992, Dr. Burzan participated in the founding of the Social Democratic Party of Reformists and was elected vice president of that party. And from 92 to 96, he was a member of the Montenegrin Party, the Parliament. Uh, his party merged with the established Social Democratic Party in 1996, at which time he was elected vice president of the combined party, the position he holds to this day. So let me turn first to Dr. Burzan to tell us about uh, his perspectives on the situation in the Balkans in general and in Montenegro and Serbia and Yugoslavia in particular. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I wish to extend the most sincere gratitude of my government to John Fitzgerald Kennedy School of Government for granting me the privilege to address you tonight. <coughs> Talking or speaking about Balkans, about southeast of Europe, cannot be done without having in the vision in mind that space where that is the space where different civilization, religions, cultures, ethnic groups competed throughout history for space and dominance, coexisting in multi ethnic, multicultural and multi confessional harmony, unfortunately only sporadically, and when so then spontaneously without political stimulation. So, we have seen four wars caused by Slobodan Milosevic, dictator in Serbia, in Belgrade, and uh, those four wars uh, produced a lot of victims, mainly civilians, and uh, once again, we have seen on southeast of Europe the practice of ethnic cleansing exercise. So that's first message 
I would say that until Milosevic is in Belgrade in power, there is no way that whole southeast of Europe and Serbia, Serbia of course, as well as Montenegro and surrounding countries can find their way to a peaceful uh, harbor, I would say. Their ships will be on rough sea, and uh, it seems to me priority that Milosevic must be removed. Removed in, in a democratic, as possibly democratic way, uh, but I believe that he is not ready to go, even if he lose any election. He is a man who has got uh, quite a strength to hit. He controls uh, functions of the states in a quite informal way, through informal channels, not through institutions of the system. So that per personal strength is uh, a kind of uh, threat for all others which uh, cannot, who cannot uh, um, simply come with a, uh, with a solution in a, a normal way. But the uh, relations with Montenegro are very tense as ever. He has uh, tried everything during the last two years to remove democratically elected government. And of course, Milosevic is not ready to give a chance to Montenegro for a democratic uh, uh, choice. Simply, uh, that is Yugoslavia, as you refer to it, is a state which has been made by Milosevic in many purposes, among those to uh, succeed ex-Yugoslavia to in propaganda uh, purposes, but as well to rule Montenegro. So that uh, attempt of Milosevic to oppress us uh, is lasting one, and of course our tendency to uh, run over businesses or simply uh, to uh, work for ourselves and for the uh, better region are really in our hands to decide and we cannot uh, give in. I must say that um, prospects for the whole region must be prospect of uh, multi-confessional and multi-cultural societies uh, since the uh, whole region is a mixture, as I said on the beginning, of different uh, cultures, ethnicities, and uh, uh, different civilizations in general. So I believe in that process, and the Montenegrin government works for that. We would like to see developed uh, cooperation among all the states, not only of ex-Yugoslavia, but in a wider region. And uh, we have been working for that, and I believe we have got a lot of success. And uh, uh, those uh, uh, relations with uh, not only, as I said, uh, uh, adjacent uh, states, uh, but uh, all the states in the region, uh, region are on increase. So we find its model for resolving overall situation in the region, and that means cooperation, but to, and uh, from cooperation we will see different form of integrations uh, on southeast of Europe, integrations into Europe, into uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, integrations. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, the southeast of Europe in that way will approach to the global model. But before that, and uh, before anything, I think that Milosevic must be removed. It means that opposition in Serbia should do everything to uh, not only convince citizens of Serbia uh, to vote their way, but to stop Milosevic as well, to misuse the situation before and after the elections and passions, which are normally in those situations very high, 
to stop him from misusing that and turning it into a war, civil war, that uh, might uh, again produce uh, consequences similar to those which have, we have seen so far. But I would uh, finish uh, my short, uh, my brief message to you by simply telling that uh, taking into account Milosevic's strength, that simply will not be enough. It means that the international community must work very closely with the opposition in Serbia and in a quite coherent way, give them a, a substantial support, solid support, because their task is not easy. It's a formidable task, and uh, I believe they will fulfill it. I hope, and in that hope, I just can add that we in Montenegro will scrutinize the situation and give them full support in that, in, in that, I would say, noble task. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Porzion. <laughs> Next, we're going to hear from Prince Alexander of Yugoslavia, who was born in exile in the United Kingdom, the son of King Peter and Queen Alexandra. And after graduating from British Royal Military Academy in a spell in the British Army, I began a career in business. And since 1991, Prince Alexander has taken an active interest in helping to reform Yugoslavia by promoting democracy, human rights, and unification of the democratic opposition to the Milosevic regime. Prince Alexander. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the Cochlis Foundation and the John F. Kennedy School of Government. I'd like to explain, first of all, my role. Uh, I am not a politician. I'm not seeking office. I'm using what was given to me as a historical name and the true spirit of my great-grandfather, Peter I, who brought uh, democracy uh, to my homeland. Um, in the last few months, there's been some activity. Uh, I convened a meeting in Athens with the whole of the opposition, which was very successful. The objective was to unite them on common policies and to make them be more cohesive together. That was followed in January by another meeting in Banja Luka in Bosnia, Republika Srpska, uh, which was also very good, but followed last weekend by a meeting in Athens in Greece. Uh, this is a key meeting that took place. And there were several resolutions that took place in that uh, one of them was the agreement uh, of everybody present uh, to create a commission to uh, look at the situation of one candidate from the opposition versus one candidate of the regime, the regime being Milosevic, uh, his wife, and possibly Mr. Sheshul on the other side, depends. The idea is that uh, the opposition knows very well their strengths and the consistencies, and they will have to work together and be cohesive and uh, put forward uh, to the, their constituents their plans uh, as we move ahead in the summer. There's a distinct possibility that the regime may call elections uh, later on this year. These are local elections by the 15th of, of November, also parliamentary elections. And uh, the possibility might be during the time of the American elections uh, when everybody's got their heads somewhere else and so the, the regime can sort of pull, a, pull wool over people's eyes. The concern is that unless one's organized and facing uh, the regime, there could be even more confusion and uh, the people would be disillusioned again. Now, I must concur a lot with Dr. Buz what Dr. Buzan said uh, regarding uh, the situation in the area. Uh, we must support the democratic opposition. You have some re very fine representatives here on my left. They need all the help possible. Uh, and uh, without a, a cohesive uh, plan, uh, it was going to be difficult, as I just said. But the help that they need, really, is also in the media area. We're examining the situation to communicate more to the people. Um, if you have a meeting, the people have to know about it. This is a very, very serious situation. Without knowledge, uh, the people are, are in the dark. Uh, the future in the region is definitely in uh, cooperation, reconciliation, no revenge, uh, respect of ethnic origin, respect of religion. Uh, the future is peace, 
if there's peace in Belgrade. This is in the interest of the whole of southeastern Europe, the interest of all the neighboring countries, and in the interest of the union of today's uh, Yugoslavia. And then the progression in democracy will solve everything once everybody has the knowledge, and we will have even better elections. I, I think this is what we owe to the people. Uh, we cannot go back. We cannot uh, live in the past. We have to live in the future. And it is our task to get rid of uh, the last dictatorship in Europe. Thank you. Let me now turn to Dr. Milan Protic, who is president of the Serbian Democratic Forum, uh, Serbian Democratic Forum Defense. Dr. Protic received his PhD in contemporary university history at the University of California in Santa Barbara and is one of Serbia's best known historians. He's been actively involved in political events since 1992 when he served as an independent member of the broad opposition coalition. His political party, the Serbian Democratic Forum Defense, is the leading and integral component of the Alliance for Change, the coalition of democratic opposition parties. Dr. Protic. Thank you, Dean. Uh, we all ask ourselves one simple but difficult question. How come that for a full 10 years we were not able to replace and overthrow Milosevic's regime? And uh, what should be done to achieve that aim? And I'll suggest a couple of reasons why we failed to do so. The first one is inconsistency from both sides. On one side, the inconsistency of the policies and attitudes of the international community towards Milosevic's regime, which labeled him in 1992 as butcher of the Balkans, in 1995 as the major factor of peace and stability in the region, uh, only to indict him for war crimes in 1999. The other one is the inconsistency of the behavior of the opposition in Serbia, which started with a very strong opposition to Milosevic, uh, leading almost to a forceful conflict in 1991. Later on, the leading opposition party joined the government in the most crucial and critical moment and helped Milosevic survive, which was, uh, I believe, a pretty confusing message sent to our people. Now, they also, now they're again against Milosevic, uh, asking for themselves the leading role in the opposition movement to democratize Serbia. The other reason why we were not able to replace Milosevic is the fact that since 1990, even though we had all kinds of elections, we never had elections with an unpredictable outcome. All elections for the last 10 years were organized by Milosevic, and the great majority of our population knew in advance what the outcome is going to be, regardless of their own votes. And uh, it's going to be our greatest task to persuade the general public, our constituency back home, that the upcoming elections by the end of this year will offer them a chance to really choose by their free will the future of themselves, of, of the country they live in. To do that, we need to provide mechanisms of democratic reform in Serbia. We have to ensure the possibility that if we have the majority vote behind ourselves, we are really going to replace Milosevic and go for comprehensive transformation of the political and economic system in that country. And I strongly believe that the unified opposition in Serbia has both the force and the means to do so. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a very, very tough job that we have uh, put before ourselves. But um, I'm now more optimistic than I ever was um, I like to say an optimist out of despair because simply we don't have any other way. Thank you. Thank you.
Next, we'll hear from Dr. Zoran Djindic, who is chairman of the Democratic Party of Serbia. Dr. Djindic is one of the founders of the Democratic Party and its leader since 1994. He served as a Minister of Parliament of Yugoslavia from 1990 until 1997, at which time his party boycotted the state-manipulated elections. In 1997, he became the first Democratic mayor of Belgrade. Dr. Djindic. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, the history of Balkan is the long history of disintegration and instability, and of course, at the same time, the history of failed attempts to find a concept for stability. Uh, we re remember three such concepts, Kantka monarchy, Ottoman Empire, and Yugoslavia. To, uh, find a concept for integration for such complex society, we need strong democratic institutions and market economy, free market economy. We didn't have in the last few centuries uh, nothing of, from them. And the uh, short times of stability were at the same time the times of dictatorship. Uh, Balkan was stable as dictator, dictatorship or it was anarchy, anarchy in Balkan. And uh, in the crisis of uh, last Yugoslavia, it was not understood, really not understood by international community, that it was not just political crisis, and uh, it, is not, it was not enough to have crisis management for this crisis, that it was uh, just uh, end of a chain of uh, disintegration uh, since centuries. And we are the first generation uh, who can stop this dis disintegration. But we need international support. Uh, we have the first time in the history of Balkans, we have a favorable international environment. We have integration as mainstream in Europe, in the world. It is the really first time since we have Balkan crisis that uh, we don't have at the same time world crisis world wars. Uh, only Belgrade uh, cities in, in, in Serbia, capital city in, uh, from Yugoslavia, was in 20th century uh, the, main, the, the capital city from six different states with different ideologies, different territories, and different uh, administrations. And you can imagine how stable can be th this state after uh, this century. But now, at the beginning of new century, uh, we have the, the opportunity to end this chain of disintegration and to start with really new politics for Balkan. And uh, we, can, uh, we can achieve this goal only if the international commu community understands that it is a real uh, uh, oppor opportunity for uh, many centuries and that we are uh, people that, we ca that, that can uh, achieve this. Uh, the people in, in, in Serbia uh, can resolve the political problem in the country, can remove Milosevic and his regime without help from outside. But the people need a vision. The people need a future. The people need a guarantee to be accepted as part of democratic Europe. I'm not sure that, uh, uh, that the world community understands this in this sense. I think the problem is seen as problem of Milosevic, as problem of uh, this generation of people in Serbia, as problem of uh, uh, mistakes of, of politicians, uh, but uh, the, the roots of problems uh, are too deep to be understood in so simple way. If the politicians in, 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 in West uh, uh, Europe and America uh, think that the problem is only political system, Milosevic, and that is uh, just uh, politics as usual, we cannot resolve this crisis. We will have further disintegration, and uh, we have uh, some places in, in, in this region uh, uh, where can uh, uh, this process continue. In Bosnia, in Serbia, in Macedonia, uh, they are all multi-ethnic states and can be, uh, can be destroyed uh, if we cannot stop this process of, of disintegration. Uh, I think uh, we will uh, win these this, uh, elections in this year, but uh, we don't have illusions. 
it is uh, too deep the crisis in Balkans to be resolved by uh, elections. We must mobilize the positive energy in this region by uh, uh, setting this, this vision of a uh, new Balkan, Balkan without wars, Balkan with, with uh, 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 political uh, uh, tolerance, and Balkan, Balkan as, as part of united Europe. Uh, if we can offer this uh, vision to the people in Serbia, I'm sure the majority of the people will vote for changes. It means for democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, I'll turn to Dr. Vesna Pesic, Vice President of Civic Alliance for Change. Dr. Pesic received her PhD in sociology at the University of Belgrade and served as the first president of the Civic Alliance of Serbia. Dr. Pesic is the founder of the Center for Anti-War Action, the first peace organization in Serbia. She was recognized for her efforts by the National Endowment for Democracy, which awarded her its biennial award for democracy. Dr. Pesic is also a recipient of the Sakharov Freedom Prize. Presently, she's director of the Center for Anti-War Action and a member of the executive board of the Civic Alliance for Serbia. Dr. Pesic. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be tonight here at Harvard. to have such a great chance to have uh, my ideas here at the table. I was thinking about the changes, our topic tonight, for about more than 10 years. And recently, I even founded a political team, a group of experts that we try to put together all of our ideas, how we can really change our society and to see a better future. In that respect, I will uh, suggest maybe a little bit uh, different accent tonight. I would suggest that we defocus from Milosevic to changes. Uh, we talk too much about Milosevic. <laughs> to change that point and to look really for the future, we have to look to the solutions. The first thing that we are discussing today on our closed session is that we have very clear vision what we want, that we have a platform, that we have a program which is going to unite all of us for the future. This is not a big thing, what we're thinking about. What we want is that we have normal life in Serbia, that we live in peace, that we can really uh, make plans for the future, that we can uh, buy a refrigerator if, we, if it, uh, one is spoiled, that we can plan to have a uh, new car, that we have be, uh, buy gasoline and not to use cans, you know, uh, where, and because our stations for gasoline are not working. Just a very simple thing, that we want to integrate Balkans and to be very proud that we are Balkans. We don't like to be ashamed because we are Balkans. That's a very, very simple picture that we member of the be member of United Europe and see our future united in Europe and also in international community. For this simple goal that we have, we need three things. The first thing is whether we have people behind us to support such vision. I have to be honest and say that for a longer time in Serbia, we really didn't have much support for such a vision and for vision of democratic Serbia and Serbia to be the member of Europe. But recently, I think the majority of Serbs, of people, of citizens are for this vision. We have majority and we have people behind and all the meetings, rallies that we had and also service are showing that we have majority for the future and for changes. The second thing that we need, and I have to say this, we're lacking still uh, 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 really uh, uh, support, that we don't have uh, for the moment a really uh, built political alternative. What I want to say, we are now in the phase of building democratic forces all together to have a front, a community of all democratic forces because it is needed that these people who want to have change, that they have really to whom and for whom to vote on elections that we're expecting. We have to build a real political alternative for people who would like to have changes. And the third thing is, as was mentioned here several times, it is the help of international community. I will use one metaphor to show you how we feel in Serbia. International community closed us in a cage 
left us inside of the beast and locked us from outside and said, now you beat the beast. We don't really know how we can be closed in the cage and really beat the beast inside. So what we want really is that this door is unlocked so that some air, fresh air can come, that we communicate with the world and we redesign the sanctions and to see how we can be really helped from outside. We cannot do a beat the beast alone and feeling that we are alone. In that respect, I would suggest that uh, we have a lot of help for building our broken bones of our society, of our civil society, that there is a real promise that Serbia, Yugoslavia will be helped after changes that were not left alone. And also there is a need for psychological support. And I would just launch one idea here in Harvard that feeling so alone that we don't have enough friends that might be starting some kind of lobby groups and to say, we are friends of democratic Serbia. I know that you have students, acad academic people, who can work and help us psychologically, giving support for our changes and democratic forces to win. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Borzan, would you, having heard your fellow panelists, would you like to add anything at this point, or shall we turn to questions from the audience? I think we can turn to the questions. All right. We have microphones for questions here on the floor, and I believe in the balcony, or can I can't see whether we have them in the balcony. In any case, we have two microphones here. I'd like you to please um, identify yourself and ask one question. Uh, and you may want to specify which panelist you want to address it to, or if it's more than one, you can specify more than one. Would you like to start? Yes, my name is Bora Baraman. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. Um, you've outlined uh, an attractive vision and somewhat of a program for replacing the regime in Yugoslavia. What are the prospects that the regime will once again use war and conflict with neighboring entities as a tool to frustrate your mobilization efforts. Will the Serbian population once again respond to those conflicts? And what will be your response? Because in the past, the opposition has been left quite helpless in the face of the conflicts and unable to mobilize during times that the Serbians have been at war with the neighbors. Thank you. Would you like to start, Dr. Yes, uh, I will just briefly comment on this. Um, yes, uh, just now Milosevic has completed full preparation for a fifth war on Balkans. It means if uh, things in Montenegro do not go his way, he might intervene. And uh, actually, he has been threatening us for quite a long time. But you see, we got experience from the previous wars, and we know perfectly well that political maneuvering, even if it takes a year or two, is much better thing to do than get involved in the conflict. So yes, Milosevic is looking for another conflict that might help him to stay in power in Serbia. But uh, he will not find partners for the conflict with Montenegrins, with the government of Montenegro. Uh, I doubt that uh, after that, if he would be successful to create that conflict, the final conflict would be conflict in Serbia. And uh, even for that conflict, he has prepared already. Thank you. Yes, and in the balcony, is that, yes. Hello, my name is Daryl Lee. I'm a student at Harvard College. Um, my question is for the members of the internal opposition, specifically for Dr. Zoran Jindic. I believe um, for someone in your position, it is probably not very difficult to make the case that Milosevic has brought harm to the Serbian people during his time as a political leader. But it is also true that he's brought even more harm to people in Bosnia and Croatia and Kosovo. 
And I was wondering if this was a fact that you are able or willing to draw to the attention of the Serbian people in your campaign for change. Who would like to respond? Mm. Well, I think our priority is to prevent uh, and to avoid these uh, wars in the future uh, and to uh, change uh, the regime uh, early enough not to, to uh, create new war. We will have elections in this year, but uh, we are aware and we are realistic enough to know that uh, he will not uh, give up after these elections, even if he will lose this. Uh, we have a difficult situation because, uh, because he is indicted uh, uh, for the Hague Tribunal and he uh, cannot lose elections because that is the, the question of, of uh, life for him. But uh, we must win elections, that is the question of surviving for us. And that is the, now the, the main, main issue in, in Serbia. Uh, uh, to be frankly, the people don't have enough energy to think about the past, even not about the, the own past, uh, uh, even not about Kosovo, about part of, of Serbia. And uh, uh, if we can uh, direct this, this at attention to future, uh, we will be happy. Uh, it is very difficult in the country with uh, $50 monthly salary, average salary, $50 monthly, uh, to think about uh, uh, about problems of other uh, nations and people. And uh, if we can uh, m uh, mobilize people to do something for the future of this country, uh, we will have enough time in the future uh, to, uh, to, to, to ask us uh, who uh, is uh, guilty for, for the, for the uh, tra tragedies in the past. Let me ask the other side of the balcony. Thank you very much. My question for you is about a year ago as NATO was considering bombing Yugoslavia, a number of people claimed that perhaps it wasn't the best idea because it would push uh, the vast majority of the population closer to Milosevic. What I'd like to ask you is, how did you feel about the bombing? And do you feel that you are stronger and closer to the population now, or were you stronger and closer to them before the bombing? We'll all answer to this question, uh, I think. I'll tell you frankly, I felt let down. I felt sad because we were bombed and the reason was that the international community couldn't cut a deal with Milosevic. And when they uh, finally realized that all their attempts were in vain, they decided to bomb us. So I can't say that I felt angry. I can't say that I felt frustrated. I can only say that I felt very sad and, and disappointed in a lot of ways. And I believe that the majority of the people in Serbia never felt uh, close to Milosevic because of it, but they felt like they have been abandoned by everyone. We believe that the international community, the Western world, is going to help us bring democracy. And what we got were arrangements with, with Milosevic, and when that failed, uh, we got ourselves bombed. But uh, now we, the only thing that we can do is look up to the future, hope that that's not going to happen again, and that together, uh, uh, with the best intentions of the West, we will be able to bring democracy, uh, peace, and peace of mind to our nation. I think it would be interesting to... Uh, it would be interesting to hear from each panelist on this question. Dr. Borzon, you had indicated that you would like to say something. Well, I just uh, wanted to say one uh, sentence. NATO had no alternative. Uh, perhaps people have forgotten that Milosevic at that time uh, ethnically cleansed Kosovo. And, uh, put thousand, thousand of people, hundred of thousand, almost million, on move. And uh, there is some, uh, some things, some order, and uh, that must be respected. He does not respect it. It's very simple. 
Prince Alexander, you want to comment on this? Yes, I think the, <clears throat> the West failed dramatically in not understanding the situation in the former Yugoslavia at the collapse of the Soviet Empire when the Berlin Wall came down. The leaders were going to use negative nationalism and negative religion. And as it was explained earlier on, we had uh, war situations, peace situations, which were sold to the public over state-run media. I think the bombing was counterproductive. Certainly, uh, when I was a student in the United Kingdom, you learned about the Blitz. It only hardened people uh, against the enemy. In this case, uh, the bombing uh, was a criminal act, and uh, it certainly reinforced Mr. Milosevic. I, um, I would have hoped that diplomacy uh, would have been the answer, but uh, how can you conduct diplomacy uh, with the, the monster or the beast, as it's been put, uh, but remind you that every foreign minister, every foreign secretary, some congressmen, uh, even religious people went to see Milosevic. Uh, what does that achieve? Nothing. He received them very well, probably gave them a scotch. Uh, I, I don't think we're getting anywhere. Uh, with this sort of attitude. So the, the alternative is for the opposition to unite, have one policy, which is the policy of democracy, to get rid of him, uh, to be ready for elections, and then take it down the road uh, in the sense that the reforms are done, and then you have the first meaningful elections, and then I hope that nobody else will be bombed in the world, because we're in the 21st century, and I think this is, uh, this is one of the Middle Ages that we're seeing at the moment. Uh, I think we can do better, and here's the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Let's move it forward. Politics for democracy. Uh, Dr. Dr. Pesic, would you like to join? Yeah, I would like just to add something to this very important question for all of us. Um, I'll just say bluntly that it was a big mistake bombing of Serbia. Uh, there are many reasons for that. I'll just say something from the, from the opposition point of view, not taking into account all the destruction, the ecological problems. And uh, as opposition, uh, we have to explain now much more to our people why we have to join Europe and why democracy is so nice. They say, why is that your, uh, especially Dr. Jinjic and I was always blaming they were pro-Western, they were like uh, Western countries, they were like democracy, they said, they were uh, American spies and so on. And now we have to explain, like, oh, what is your Western, what is your democracy? Just sending bombs to us. So now we have to put much more words, you know, to really convince people that democracy and having democratic institution is really worthwhile. Secondly, which is nobody was thinking about that, that with bombing and with complete break with Yugoslavia, uh, we don't even have now a facade of democracy in our country. Uh, connection with the West, it was also that we had to be a little bit pretending that we have some democratic institution. Now we feel that Milosevic, the regime, can do anything with us without being responsible. Nobody is asking him for anything. We don't think that China will ask Milosevic now, where are free media, where are democratic institutions, because they are our, our best friends. So I think that this complete breakdown with the West brought a little more a more, the little more difficult situation to fight for democracy in Serbia. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. yeah bombing is never a good idea. In, in, in this case, it was a uh, worst idea. Uh, if you remember, the uh, official reason uh, to bomb, to start with the bombing, was uh, that Milosevic didn't accept Rambouillet agreement. After 10 days of bombing, uh, the reason was uh, the refugees problem in Kosovo. But it, was, it wasn't a reason at the beginning of the bombing. And now uh, uh, daily life in Kosovo is less secure than before the bombing, and the problems in Balkans are uh, bigger than before the bombing. And Milosevic is not, not uh, weaker than before the bombing. Uh, in contrary, he is stronger now than, than before the bombing. But, uh, we have luck to, to, uh, to have the people, uh, they understand the difference between NATO and, and a democratic world. But that is the, the, uh, the, the, the question of 
of the mind of the people in Serbia. And uh, it is not so uh, very good ex explained by the international community that the NATO is not the democratic world. The people in, in Serbia uh, want to be part of democratic uh, world, although they are very angry bec uh, because of, of NATO bombing. Uh, let's now turn toward the other floor microphone. Before I make any other remarks, I would like to say that I am unconditionally for monarchy without vote, <laughs> without discussion. <laughs> In America or in Serbia? <laughs> okay. The reason is that whenever the Serbs had kingdom, from Nemanic to Kara Djordjevic, we had freedom. When the <laughs> whenever there was no king, there was no freedom. And your question? <laughs> in order to understand my other remarks, let me, let no, me. no, we have one panel which makes speeches. Please, a question. The question is this. Why has the West failed us uh, after the Second World War when Winston Churchill decided that Marshal Tito would rule Yugoslavia, when I became a refugee and celebrated the birthday of, of Prince Alexander in a refugee camp? Milosevic was two years and a half old on that, on that day. Whatever Milosevic read from elementary school to university, <laughs> Winston Churchill decided. Before the disintegration of Yugoslavia started in, in The Hague, Milosevic requested a referendum, one man, one vote, to decide democratically the question of Yugoslavia. But United Germany, United Europe, United Kingdom, United Nations, and United States united to disunite Yugoslavia. The question is, the, why did the West <laughs> fail on this? Perhaps Prince Alexander, since you were referred to, you would choose to answer this. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dean. Well, everybody knows the years of communism at least we can say that we're very thankful that it came to an end in 1989 of the collapse of the Berlin Wall and Moscow. But then uh, the other countries who were the satellite countries moved ahead, some faster than others. Uh, in the case of the former Yugoslavia, well, we, we paid the price for the horrible things. This morning we were brainstorming, as, as uh, one of the panelists told you, and uh, there was a, one of the persons said, Oh, things are moving well, well ahead in, in Croatia, and we gave them a lot of head and a lot of help and campaigning and so on, and everybody was nodding and things like that. But you know why? Why it went ahead? Because the man there got cancer. So I said, you know, how about giving cancer to the beast? <laughs> <laughs> so really, and don't treat him at Walter Reed Hospital, <laughs> like the other one was treated. But so this is it. We're suffering in a, in a sort of the end of the Second World War. Uh, really took place at the, at the last decade of the last century. And we still we have not achieved uh, full democracy. The peripheral states, I'm taking this a little further, the peripheral states are all moving towards the European Union. And the center states uh, are sort of stuck. That is, Yugoslavia today, Montenegro and Serbia are stuck in this time warp really because of one man. But the big danger, uh, unless we move the process towards democracy, and heal our wounds, is that there is possibly this other war, this terrible war that nobody wants, uh, Montenegro, everybody wants to live in peace. The danger is, as was so well mentioned before, is the war possibly in Serbia, which is another by time occasion for Milosevic, and that's Vojvodina. Uh, then after that, I would venture to say uh, there is the case of him starting up a situation on the peripheral in uh, Macedonia or Skopje, depending upon your feelings. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is another real case, and we really cannot afford this. Now, billions of dollars went into this uh, bombing campaign. Uh, there is m money allocated for democracy uh, assistance in Serbia, but there's really not enough. And here we are talking, but really we cannot communicate 
to the people what we're talking about. Again, I come back to the media, and then maybe the people will be happy. Certainly, I'd like to see myself back in my home. There's somebody else living in my home at the moment. Uh, um, and I'd like to open the doors uh, for everyone. Everybody in, in this room, you're ho welcome to come. Uh, and let's, let's see, the contribution of this great uh, college would be wonderful. But unless we remove this man, and there'll be another disaster in this first decade. Uh, and we really don't want to have the Middle Ages of the last decade or the last two decades catch up with us. Thank you. Let's turn, <laughs> yes. we'll turn to the other floor microphone. And I'd uh, like to remind people, please identify yourself. Uh, right. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, is there any chance that Yugoslavia will, be, will ever be united, will ever be united again? The question was, is there any chance that Yugoslavia will ever be united again? Reunited. Would like reunited, by, by which I assume you mean the parts that are not now Yugoslavia. That's right. Y yes. Y yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Whole, uh, the whole of the former Yugoslavia and so forth. Well, it's a very good question. I think you should take this in relation to what's happening in the European Union. Uh, certainly the case of the former Yugoslavia, Slovenia uh, is an associate member of the European Union. Croatia is moving ahead in a very positive way, and its application surely might go in uh, in lot the long term. Um, regarding the rest, we're sort of in a time warp. And as I mentioned earlier on, the peripheral countries will move into the European Union. Uh, that is basically uh, the Hungarys, uh, the, the Romanias, and the Bulgarias at different times. So really, what will unite us, to answer your question, is a united Europe. But then, if you put democracy in Belgrade, everything is possible because, really, through democracy, you can only grow by respecting all the people of the former Yugoslavia. So what's the next equation with democracy there? There could be all sorts of arrangements which are loose binding confederations, regional governments, which would include uh, not only the preservation of today's Yugoslavia, Serbia, and Montenegro, but arrangements also with the Bosnia situation, and arrangements indeed with Macedonia. Uh, these are all very real things that could happen once uh, the machinery is dismantled and everybody is in the know and everybody feels secure uh, and everybody has a job and investments are coming in and everybody's free to move around. That will be the future. Let's turn now to a question from the left side of the balcony. Uh, hello, Nathan Meyer. I'm a student at the college. Uh, the Balkans, uh, in addition to being known as a region of instability, have also acquired the reputation of being somewhat of a powder keg of Europe, even into the modern day uh, with the bombing campaign's early failure and Chinese embassy bombing not exactly doing wonders for the credibility of NATO in Northern Europe. Um, and also countries in the process of democratization are not known for the stability either. Were Milosevic to be eliminated or somehow disappear, do you see any possibility for dangers to the rest of Europe or the immediate neighborhood of the Balkans? in the uh, democratization process of Yugoslavia. Dr. Protic, you are a distinguished historian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Milosevic is considered the black hole of the Balkans, and that's pretty much true. I would say that the old misconceptions and differences and misunderstandings among Balkan nations and states are all over with. There's only one problem now there in the central Balkans, and, that Mil and that's Milosevic. I would say that uh, uh, some of those countries and states outside Serbia made tremendous attempts in the last 10 years to overcome their century-long differences and misunderstandings. And I would be pretty optimistic about the future of the region once Milosevic is replaced and removed and Serbia uh, steps on the course of, of true democracy. So. Uh, I would say that very slowly and, and with a lot of delay, the Balkans are catching up with the experiences of Europe and that that type of uh, uh, overcoming old differences and conflicts is uh, gradually coming to the Balkans too. And I don't think that any kind of destabilization or conflict is feasible in the Balkans except for those that could be provoked by Milosevic himself. The other side of the balcony. 
Oh, <coughs> sorry, did, I couldn't uh, see. Dr. Pesci. I just want to, a uh, little correction. We have to quarrel all the time, you know, so <laughs> just to say, I agree completely with my colleague, uh, Dr. Protic, that uh, we won't probably in future have conflicts uh, w once we don't have Milosevic, but I would just like to draw your attention that as we had a very strong Serbian nationalist movement through these 10 years, that we have a very strong also Albanian nationalist movement, and that it's not the only Milosevic because it can go to Macedonia and through Kosovo. So this south of our uh, Balkan Peninsula is not secure. So Milosevic and also we have to, uh, uh, how to say, calm down very strong also Albania nationalistic movement. Dr. Brozan. Well, I, I must comment on this and tell that, yes, Milosevic is someone who has to go. I said that in the beginning and, but he's not whole is only the part of the, a part of the problem. And uh, Milosevic has not produced anything to make him that strong and charismatic, uh, at least not in the period before 1986, when he became leader of all Serbs. Milosevic, I like that expression because it's very plastic, got into a resonance with political thought of Serbia stemming from the 19th century and the time of liberation. And the, that thought is not applicable anymore in a modern world. So I don't see danger only of Milosevic, I see danger of all who carry that thought. And uh, the thought of any great national programs on Balkans. That means that is a war, simply. So I think that many people, I'm not going to detail, in many politicians in Serbia still have, have not realized the devastating power of Serbian nationalism and the price that not only Serb people, but the others had to pay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's go to the other side of the balcony. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nikolai Rusanov. I'm a junior at Harvard College. And back at home in Russia, I was a member of leadership of the Youth Union of Right Forces and other democratic organizations. My question is mostly to, uh, to Dr. Jinjic and Dr. Pesic, leaders of the opposition. Remember in the years 97, 96, 97, where my fellow democratic activists in Moscow were organizing uh, rallies in support, solidarity demonstrations in support of uh, Zayedno rallies in, in Belgrade. But nevertheless, over the past five years, Russia was viewed mostly as a moral, if not material, supporter of the re Milosevic's regime. Uh, but recently, recently, Vuk Drashkovich, your former ally, and then former Milosevic's ally, and now, now nobody knows who, uh, flew, uh, flew to Moscow, and he was very warmly welcomed uh, by our foreign minister, and uh, apparently he received some, some, some implicit or maybe explicit support from, from, from Putin. So I would uh, like to know what you think, why, why Putin chose, uh, chose to su support Drashkovich, or that's just his way of gaining leverage over you know, Milosevic to, to make him more, more servile, or he really believes that, that Milosevic is, uh, Milosevic will leave and, and Drashkovich will succeed, or why, why, why that happened and what do you think about it? Uh, Dr. Jinjic and Dr. Peshis, the question was addressed to you. Why don't you start, Dr. Jinjic? Well, uh, we don't know really how much uh, was uh, support for Drashkovic and his vision and politics in Serbia. Uh, what do we know? That he was accepted by uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ivanov. And they talked more, mostly about Kosovo, that was the main topic, and not so much about uh, opposition and changes uh, that we're talking in now. Uh, we think that it's good that uh, opposition gets support from Russia. 
and also from West and also from Russia. So I think generally that it was useful to get support. But I don't know how much it was support for changes uh, uh, of the uh, political situation or how it was more discussion around Kosovo. It oh. was not quite clear. In, in political establishment in Moscow, there were speculations that there was some talk about, about the upcoming elections and therefore some kind of support to, to the opposition. I, nobody knows what exactly, of course. I agree with you. Nobody knows exactly, yes. <laughs> Dr. Jinjic, would you like to comment? No? Okay. Uh, let's uh, now go to the floor on this side. Thank you. I'm Patrick Egan. I'm a student at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And I have a question in particular for Drs. Protic, Dinjic, and Pesic concerning Montenegro. Uh, while the U.S. has uh, applied strict sanctions to, to Serbia, it has provided a great deal of aid to Montenegro, its political and economic reform. And part of the rationale for this, uh, supposedly, is that it would have some impact on uh, Serbia, uh, some support to the opposition movement in Serbia uh, in terms of um, somehow undermining the regime and giving some sort of model to the opposition movement in Serbia. What, if any, impact is that high, highly visible support to Montenegro, Montenegro's progress? having on the movement in Serbia. Thank you. Yes, uh, we support, uh, we all support uh, the, the democratic government in Montenegro, and we think the people in Montenegro should uh, decide about their future. And uh, we are sure without Milosevic in Belgrade, uh, we have a common future, and we will have uh, uh, some kind of common state. But uh, I don't think that this uh, aid was uh, uh, important and big enough uh, to be visible in that way. I, I'm often in Montenegro and I don't see a uh, difference between the situation in Montenegro and the living standard in Montenegro and in Serbia. I think the aid from uh, $25 million uh, per year is not uh, visible enough. Maybe with one zero. Uh, uh. Perhaps I could cl clarify then. What, if any, impact is the progress, whatever progress is being made in Montenegro, what, if any, impact, aid aside, is that having on the It is. Movement? It is important for us uh, that the people uh, can see that, that Milosevic uh, uh, is not, not uh, uh, so uh, strong to catch Montenegro and to enforce his politics in Montenegro. But it doesn't depend on, on the inter international aid from Montenegro. I don't think that international aid is, is enough. I think it is, it is not enough. I think uh, it is, it is uh, only symbolic and rhetoric and not, not real material and financial aid. Uh, the other side on the floor. I'm Sasha Djakovic, and I have a question for Dr. Burzan. Um, where do you see uh, the close future of Montenegro? Uh, uh, do you see that in, within Yugoslavia, even in case of unfavorable? Uh, outcome of elections? Where do you see the future? Well, I of see the future Montenegro. of Montenegro as a sovereign country, um, very directly. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it might sound absurd. I think that from that position, because that is a position in which all. Um, potentials can be, in a way, resolved in natural components. We have to start thinking about new integrations, form of first cooperation, as I said, and then integration. So I hope I was very direct to your question. Yes, you were. Thank you. But one thing more, uh, that state, I think, must be reached through first. Um, as a democratic outcome uh, in Montenegro, it means democratic referendum, and in talks as well with all others who might be interested in, uh, in uh, those developments. Now we cannot do that step, and that must be clear why, because Milosevic is waiting for that uh, thing we do, and we are not going to give him a chance. So we now exercise patience. But what I said just a minute ago is uh, my personal attitude, and uh, it is in a uh, uh, ruling coalition is divided. Uh, 
mainly divided about, about that issue. But it doesn't mean that we will not function further on together and uh, I think uh, successfully. Prince Alexander, you wanted to comment? Yes, thank you. Um, and of course, in the heat of the moment, you can get all sorts of uh, wrong situations. Uh, I don't think uh, this is the moment. Of course, uh, there's the expression of wisdom here, which we just heard. Uh, Self-determination is very nice, but at the moment, Milosevic would uh, long to see the situation fired up at the opportune moment to buy a few months or a year or whatever plus in power. So really, we must uh, cool it, uh, not allow uh, provocation. And then uh, once uh, Serbia has got uh, a proper democratic government that works for the people, not against the people, uh, I think everybody will cool down uh, dramatically because we've been together historically and we do get on. But this also means that we must discuss what form of government there should be and uh, more of the regional type, maybe more of a feder federation type or confederation type, whatever. But the people really don't know these issues. All they're thinking about is how to survive uh, on, on $50 or less per month, as was put uh, just now. Uh, and uh, they really have a, a dismal situation at the moment, and the machine is just feeding them so much propaganda. So I would hope that the future can be settled in a, in a proper democratic way. In the balcony. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Srijan Tanga. I am a junior here at Harvard, and my question goes to Dr. Burjan. You just said that you're for a sovereign Montenegro, and yet s er earlier you said that you're against any kind of violence uh, in Montenegro in an attempt to achieve this goal. And it seems very highly unlikely that Milosevic, who didn't let, uh, Mon who didn't let uh, Slovenia, Croatia, or Bosnia leave peacefully, that he will leave, he would let Montenegro go peacefully. On the other hand, you also say that you support the efforts of the Serbian uh, opposition to oust Milosevic but uh, due to the unresolved, if you will, situation in Montenegro, Milosevic may choose not to call the federal elections that are later this year and therefore the municipal elections as well. So it's the, it seems that we have two uh, progressive forces from Serbia here today, but they are not exactly working in perfect unison. Wouldn't a better strategy be for the democratic government of Montenegro and the democratic opposition in Serbia to launch, launch a countrywide democratic initiative and ask for federal elections as opposed to avoid them, as it currently is the situation? Well, it's, it's much more complicated. You see, federal election mean, might mean this or that. It might be a long way back for Montenegro, in many terms. And uh, we have discussed that a lot, but we haven't reached solution among ourselves in coalition. I'm sure, let's say, that uh, in one hand, we would like to see Milosevic go and help coalition. In other hand, we cannot at any price, uh, gamble with uh, results we got in hands, with the destiny of our people there, because, because that step might lead to the conflict. People misjudge uh, sources of conflict. They think that only uh, departure from uh, Milosevic might be a reason for him to hit. Because that state is Milosevic state, after all. Don't forget it. And uh, I think that staying with Milosevic and his needs to be engaged in conflict is much more dan dangerous for us. So things are complicated along that lines. Things are not that simple on, on surface, black and white. You have to think about uh, in categories, but then to calculate long, long way from that. And you will find that uh, uh, just thinking rationally uh, and having a priority uh, to avoid the conflict, uh, if you make uh, those cal calculations just on, on a, uh, categories, you, you might 
find yourself into the conflict, and that would be very dangerous. Dr. Pesci. I just want to make one small intervention. Um, I really respect very much uh, Dr. Buzan and his opinion, but there is not so much difference between Serbia and Montenegro in creation of Mr. Milosevic. I would just remind that in 91, <laughs> The mobili mobilization was much more successful in Montenegro than in Serbia. Then when we think about 92, about the Zhablia constitution, where Montenegro, and Montenegro was participating very much. And finally, just to remind you that the, for the president of Yugoslavia, your representatives in federal parliament elected Milosevic. No, nobody is perfect. <laughs> well, not even Montenegrin. But <laughs> Dr. Burzan, uh, I would like to say that uh, my dear friend Vesna Pesic has <laughs> forgotten that on January 1989, Milosevic performed coup de time in Montenegro, and. Uh, during all those uh, developments, although I don't uh, agree with the figures, he ruled Montenegro. So uh, from that position onward, Montenegro was taken by some new spirit. And I don't see the reason why we shouldn't support that spirit and uh, grow that very, very, very uh, nice uh, flower flower of democracy. Yes, Prince Alexander. I, I don't think we're here to... Um, to <laughs> <laughs> I don't think here we're, we're here to, uh, to praise what Milosevic achieved or, 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 or didn't achieve. Um, certainly, I think he, he would enjoy this conversation because it's exactly what he wants. <laughs> Um, I'd like to sum it up. I think all of us here at this table are for democracy, for human rights, the respect of all religions and all ethnic, uh, ethnic groups. So let's get on with that task and not give Milosevic the luxury uh, of dissent. <clears throat> Let me turn to the floor here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mariana Lenkova. I'm from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Um, my question is, if we assume the best case scenario that you win the elections, do you have a position now what your, uh, well, what is your position on the issue of the final status of Kosovo? Because I think that inevitably you will be faced with that. So I was wondering whether you're already preparing for that. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to answer that question. We will not be in a position to decide upon the future of Kosovo because Milosevic has done all in his capacity to take that responsibility from us. Uh, as you very well know, the realities of Kosovo uh, are that it has been governed both militarily and uh, politically by the international community, and we will have to cope with that fact. Within the limits of our powers, we will try to do our best to help the situation in Kosovo. And at a certain point of time, as uh, um, uh, we, together with the international community and the Kosovo Albanians, decide to salmon a conference on the future status of Kosovo, we'll be there to find a peaceful solution to that problem. But as it is right now, Kosovo is still officially a part of the Yugoslav Federation, though under special status. And our primary interest is to secure uh, security of every individual that lives there and gradually to help or discuss or cooperate with the, interna with the international community upon the return of the refugees from Serbia back to Kosovo. And I, I believe that it's too early and too sensitive to discuss the uh, final outcome of the Kosovo issue right now. Let's wait for a while, and I think that we will be in a much better position altogether 
to find the, the, the right uh, model for the future of Kosovo. Yes. Yes, um, my name is Young Su Kim, and um, Harvard is my alma mater, and I, I'm so glad that we're having this uh, forum on Yugoslavia, which is um, country of my adorable husband. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and so I, I thank you for you know for you um, and or everybody who brought it this here. Um, my, I was thinking when you, when I was hearing all this discussion about the Milosevic, or we're talking about the cat and who will about the rats who will um, uh, you know put the ball and the cat and how. Um, and also, I was thinking about the Korean um, idiom, I mean, Korean um, uh, proverb that as often, sometimes, when we throw government without really harnessing the benefits of new government, people always say the old governor was a better governor. So I think that um, if we really want to uh, democracy, um, my question would be uh, either to Dr. Zinjic or Tasich or any, any, any speaker who can respond to me that people should know not the reasons, which is a very philosophical word, but the benefit when they change the government. What is the specific benefit? Because uh, changing into democracy, we are not just changing into about the political system, we are also changing the market economy, which is just a paradigm shift. That means the people should be able to do applying for job, which they never did. And they should be applying for housing. They should earn the money for their you know, for their education, for their um, hospital systems. So how can they ever welcome heartedly, which they never paid for? So what I was thinking is that what is the benefit of it, and how do they know? If the democracy is just meaning voting, and we are talking about the many, uh, mobilizing many people for vote, but without educating people how to harness the system, we are simply using them as a voting mm -hmm. ticket. So that is not democracy, I think. but. If there is any grassroots system to mobilize the people to educate them what is the benefit of the democracy would be and how they can be supported, whether you have a voucher from the Western countries or America or wherever, who can really support financially, resource-wise, those things. So, well, that's well we need the question. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Pesic, do, do, do you want to try to answer? Well. <laughs> <laughs> The answer is yes. Overnight, about brainstorming how we can, for example, like Jesus. Okay, I give up. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, for example, oh, let me tell you something. Jesus gave, Jesus had such a follow, and we are, most of you are also the church members. Jesus gave a clear benefit of a four wall. 401k. Unconditional <laughs> surrender. We have to move on. Um, we have uh, a question in the, in the balcony, which will probably be, on, it's, the turn is this side of the balcony. This will probably have to be our last question. Ah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Dmitry Mitrinovich. I'm senior at Harvard College. And I have a question for uh, Mr. Jinjic. Uh, I'm just wondering, how can you assure Serbian voters that you'll be able to get along with Mr. Drashkovic? It is not that you only won elections in 96, you won elections in 93 and elections before that in terms of votes. And I think that your failure to, uh, to be together with Mr. Drashkovic and then maintain that unity led actually to, to the sustained power of Milosevic. So how can you assure Serbian voters that you will really be able to get along with him? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I will give you a diplomatic answer. Uh, we try now to, to build a, a wider democratic coalition uh, with the party of Mr. Zaskovic as one part of this coalition. Our problem in the past was to have only three or, or two big parties and uh, it was possible to, to uh, uh, destroy this coalition by uh, decision of one of this party and it was 96, 97. But if we have now uh, not only party coalition but uh, one democratic uh, movement, uh, Mr. Drashkovic can decide to go to Milosevic but uh, he cannot destroy this united opposition. Uh, it is uh, a new concept of 
of opposition, the old concept of opposition as party coalition is dead in Serbia because of, of this, these events for, uh, in the past. Uh, but uh, if you have alternative for our attempts now, uh, please tell me. Well, <laughs> my, uh, my impression is that, that you, can, you can definitely form a broad coalition, but uh, just looking at this past, uh, past gathering in the Republic Square, it seems that uh, Mr. Drashkovic still, still has a huge following. And you know, if, if we look at the demonstrations that you, um, along with uh, Ms. Pesic, held in 1999, uh, it seems that you really didn't manage to gather that many people. So it, it seems that Mr. Drashkovic is really the crucial part of that coalition. And again, it is just a matter of, of killing this animosity between you and him. So I'm just wondering, how can you assure us uh, that home? that will be no, no, really stop done? Stop ending the animosity between uh, Mr. Jinjic and Mr. Drashkovic is the question. Is there a prospect for that? Uh, no. Uh, it isn't uh, uh, no animosity on my on my side. I was ready to. <laughs> no, it is real. I, I I don't see this as personal problem, as personal connection between him, and and, and me. Uh, it is political uh, problem to, to resolve. Uh, my my main problem is how to remove Milosevic and not how to remove uh, Mr. Drashkovic. But uh, we have had a rally at uh, 90 of August last year. Uh, big as uh, uh, this, this last rally, uh, without uh, the official announcement uh, of Mr. Drashkovic's presence on this rally. It is, uh, I think, uh, a new uh, mood in Serbia after this spring and in the spring. It is not because of participants of leader, leaders in this uh, rally. The people uh, uh, will change is because of themselves, not because of party or, or leaders of this party. And I think the, the situation in Serbia is different now than, than in the last 10 years. Uh, I think the, the leadership of the party is not so important than in these 10 years. And I think that is the, uh, because of that, it is a, a real opportunity to do something serious. I don't believe that the uh, parties, the, even opposition parties, are uh, able to, uh, to do this job without students, without expert groups, without trade unions without democratic forces outside of the parties. But in this uh, moment now, we, we have this uh, wider coalition with all these forces together. And we can win elections, uh, we can win uh, against Milosevic. I don't want to say elections, but it is, it is not uh, uh, only elections. We can win elections, but it is not the end of this uh, uh, battle. Milosevic will not accept elections, but not accept the uh, result of elections. He will uh, reject to, to, to to uh, give, give up, and we, we must be prepared for the action uh, uh, after elections. And to be prepared, we, we need unity of all democratic forces in Serbia, and I think the people in Serbia understand this. And they are, uh, in, in, in this release, they were because of their families, not because of Drashkovic and, and me. Well, we have reached the end of our time, and I hope you will all join me in thanking the panel in the Cochlees Foundation for a very rich discussion.